Good morning, everyone. We see that uh, folks are coming online for our webinar, so we'll give it just a few minutes before we officially get started, but welcome. Good morning. I see several have already joined and logged in. We'll just give it another minute or so as people continue to log on. Okay, just a couple minutes after 10, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, happy Friday. I'm Jenny Morejon. I am the president and CEO of the Fort Lauderdale Downtown Development Authority. And welcome to our second installment of The Pulse on Downtown Fort Lauderdale, a market report series by the Fort Lauderdale DDA. We are thrilled to welcome back Colliers International to present the latest data and information on our booming residential real estate market in downtown Fort Lauderdale. We also have an amazing lineup of special guests who will provide expert firsthand insight on our residential real estate industry and why downtown Fort Lauderdale is such a hot destination for residents, for visitors, and for investment. The Fort Lauderdale Downtown Development Authority is a public-private partnership that powers the experience, growth, and prosperity of downtown Fort Lauderdale. We are a growing and vibrant metropolitan city that's evolving at the center of the South Florida region. The DDA implements projects that improve the urban core to create a wonderful destination for all. Okay. So to kick this off, we're incredibly excited to be joined by Ken Krasnow of Colliers International, who will be presenting the Residential Real Estate Report. Following the report, we are thrilled to have Alan Kennedy from Heinz, Bryce Hallweg from the Florida Panthers. Welcome, and we look forward to a wonderful season this year, Bryce. I'm sure we'll hear all about it. And we also have Michael Zafransky with Kushner Companies. So we have a stellar lineup today. Just a reminder, this is a quarterly installment series. Several of you may have been back here in the spring when we released our commercial report. And following the event today, you'll receive a link to see our residential report. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Ken, if you can go ahead and, and kick off this event. Great, well, thank you, uh, Jenny. And uh, I'm excited to be here again. As you said, this is the uh, second installment, the first uh, report that we produced dealt primarily with uh, commercial and and business activity, uh, and that was obviously a you know a strong report, very vibrant activity, and now we're going to supplement that uh, with the residential. We obviously know everybody on this call, all of our panelists that are here know that you know the two kind of main drivers of a of a vibrant. Uh, transformative city revolve around growth in both businesses and uh, in population. Uh, so like I said, we're going to start and jump in with a little bit of the uh, the demographics of the of the residential uh, activity that's taken place here in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, Jenny mentioned that this is a full uh, throated report that uh, we produced. Uh, which I think will be released right after this webinar. So we're going to touch on some of the highlights 
Uh, we really want to get into the panel discussion. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the, the demographics as will be in the report that you will all receive. Um, but a couple of key things that I think are important here to pay attention to is number one, this is a young, uh, educated, affluent community. Um, you see a lot of the uh, statistics there over on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it is a, a well-rounded community. As you see there, the, the balance, is, as much as it's a young community, there's also a strong demographic of our older empty nester uh, population. So it's a very balanced uh, community. But, but equally, if not more important for the people on this call, you look at the, the character categories around growth and, and the future. If you notice there, the downtown Fort Lauderdale population over the last, since the census, uh, has had a 41% increase in uh, population growth, and that compares with very strong population growth uh, throughout the rest of Fort Lauderdale and Broward County, but, you know, four times uh, the growth uh, and the future uh, is projected to be even stronger. We're projecting a 45% a population growth uh, in the next five years. So again, a lot of the demographics, uh, why there's a you know a strong panel of investors and uh, opportunity uh, opportunity capital here because this is a young, uh, vibrant, affluent community. Next, uh, this gives you a little bit of a breakdown of that demographic that I just talked about. And again, as you can see there, you've got um, a strong uh, demographic, both by way of, of uh, income as well as in population. It's a broad-based uh, population uh, demographic and, again, speaks well for the future of this city. Next slide. Next slide talks a little bit about how our market compares with some of our uh, brethren to the north and to the south. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to report that, as you can see as we sit here today, uh, in October, the downtown Fort Lauderdale market is outperforming and is the strongest uh, multifamily market um, comparing our, our comparable uh, downtown. So uh, every market is doing well multifamily, and I'm sure Michael will talk about this. Uh, every multifamily market across you know, our entire region uh, is doing well. But there was a lot of concern, I think, over the last couple of years, the amount of uh, uh, the amount of new construction that's been that's been uh, added to our supply, um, but there there I say you know if you look at our effective monthly monthly rental, you look at our overall occupancy rate, we have a extremely strong uh, and vibrant market. And if you look at the inventory numbers there, again it's a it's it's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's really uh, on par in terms of uh, where we where we uh, rate with uh, downtown Miami. Next. This gives um, a little overview of, you know, there's a, also a little bit of a, of a misnomer in those statistics because, you know, obviously we've delivered a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of new product. And so over on the right there are the buildings that are in lease up. Um, and so when you really just look at the stabilized market, the vacancy, the occupancy rate is over 95%. So Again, it's obvious that buildings that are in lease up are going to, you know, are going to take uh, are going to take some time. Um, but really, when you start breaking down the numbers, uh, what you see is obviously a, a, an extremely strong market. A couple of other statistics that you'll see in the report, um, which I think is strong from an investor perspective, uh, the market throughout uh, COVID really held up best compared to, uh, to our again to our brethren there were a little bit of spikes in those markets um, our market showed you know a tremendous resiliency uh, and consistency where you know the vacancy rates uh, really hovered around that you know between that three and five percent so really strong that being said obviously you know we obviously are you're on the bottom there uh, we've, we've highlighted and we'll, we'll talk in the report a little bit about some of the new construction uh, that's coming online. Uh, it's about 2,000 units. If you look at that uh, chart uh, there on the bottom, the nice thing uh, as well is that you're going to see a diverse uh, location, uh, some diverse product points, uh, pricing points uh, as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, there's a number of new projects slated. I'm sure Alan will talk about 
uh, Fat Village, but there's another uh, almost 2,000 units that are that are planned that are about to you know get uh, uh, permitted and, and under construction. So again, the the numbers bear uh, uh, fruit that uh, this market can handle uh, new construction and 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 new supply. Next. Um, one of the other exciting dynamics, as I mentioned before, in terms of the geographic diversity that we've seen, uh, this talks a little bit about some of the specific opportunities um, and the specific uh, performance in the uh, Flagler Village market, which again is a, a growing uh, neighborhood just north of, uh, of, of kind of the core downtown. But really, as you look at some of these numbers and you look at where some of these uh, buildings, you know, some of the developers that went into this market a number of years ago, a little bit on the pioneering uh, level, you see now that, you know, these, these multifamily deals are trading, you know, in, in the 325,000, uh, give or take, you know, per unit. And importantly, you're also seeing, you know, real institutional capital uh, that, that's attracted to uh, a market that, again, a number, a couple, just a couple of years ago, was really viewed as a as a little bit of a of a pioneering market, but now is really um, established as as one of the core components of our of our growing downtown. Next is um, talks a little bit about uh, as I mentioned uh, before, you know where Flagler Village is uh, is has created this neighborhood. You know any great city really needs um, and demands you know, great neighborhoods. And that's what Fort Lauderdale um, has really become. We are, a, a again, a truly diverse, uh, inclusive community where uh, young people, affluent people, empty nesters, families, uh, pet friendly, I mean, you name it, it's a, it's a city that really um, speaks to all, all, all classes, uh, and all uh, mixes of, of people. The next slide, and in the report, there's a lot more detail in here, but the next slide will give you just a little bit of an overview of some of these uh, neighborhoods. And in the report, you know, we really spend uh, a, a lot of time talking about the single family home and the condo more on the on the on the purchase uh, side of the of the equation. One of the demographics that I brought uh, up earlier showed that roughly 77% of the of the population in downtown are renters. Again, the the market as is is it's evolving and it's transforming and it's maturing and stabilizing is 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 going to eventually balance out where we'll have more owners or a comparable mix of of owners and renters. And this gives you a sort of a snapshot. And like I said in the report, you'll see that you know from the Harbor Beach and the La, La, Las Olas Isles area, which are probably some of the most exclusive markets that we have, you're talking about pricing somewhere between 2.3 and 3.2 uh, million dollars. You move a little bit further west into uh, Rio Vista, which is really known as a strong, you know, family-oriented market, still very uh, exclusive. The average uh, medium price there is around 1.4 million um a lot of growth you know kind of in that sailboat bend uh tarpon river area again neighborhoods that are known for more of their eclectic feel their historic feel you know pricing there is somewhere in the three and a quarter to four and a quarter range so again gives people some uh some different ranges i talked a little bit about you know flagler village uh, and, and again, as we move further west, as the boundaries of, of downtown expand, Progresso Village, Dorsey, which used to be, you know, kind of known as, as, as the downtown, um, you know, you're talking about average median prices between, you know, 250 and 350. So again, what we're seeing is a, is a market and is a city that is going to be able to attract uh, uh, people to attract renters, and then ultimately they they plant their roots 
uh, build their families and and uh, uh, and the city provides them a lot of uh, diversity and a lot of opportunity. So in the report, you'll see very specific breakdowns on each of these uh, neighborhoods. Um, and then, you know, Victoria Park kind of sitting there right in the middle uh, where the average median price is probably around 750. So again, talks to the real strength and the diversity um, of the city. And again, like I said, great cities uh, demand great neighborhoods and Fort Lauderdale is, is, uh, is, is ripe with them. Next, um, talk a little bit about kind of the, the big picture and kind of where uh, we see this market, you know, kind of going, I think on the top, of the screen there, we're all pretty familiar with, you know, low taxes and it's a business business friendly environment um, and quality of life. But some of the 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 drivers that are really fueling some of the growth here. I mean, you see the um, out of state migration that's very broad. You're seeing a number of West Coast. Uh, communities out there that are really making a play down here. So it's no longer just a Northeast uh, migration. You are seeing the uh, the students and the talent uh, by represented by, you know, Tallahassee and Gainesville, you know, staying home, you know, going to school and 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 ret returning home. And and talent is really the, the key driver here. And I'm sure Alan will talk about this, uh, you know, when you get into the panel discussion. But you know, historically, if you were a, a talented uh, young professional, you know, you went where the jobs were, you know, you chased the jobs. And now, you know, post COVID and, and kind of in a new uh, paradigm in the market, you know, jobs are now chasing talent. Um, talent is driven to our area. Uh, young entrepreneurial um, uh, talent is, is migrating to our areas. The companies, and again, I'm sure Alan will talk about this. Are taking notice, so they're seeing where their where their their talent is 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 choosing to move, and obviously that fuels uh, them making uh, certain you know office types decisions. Um, and part of the reason, again, why the talent is coming here is is we we obviously talked about you know the taxes and lower cost and quality of life, but some of the softer things that um, I'm sure Bryce will talk about. Uh, and and is not talked about as much in terms of, you know, it's really a welcoming community. Uh, I, I showed you the statistic on diversity uh, and inclusion. Um, people are driven to cities that embrace uh, those kind of values. Um, it's also a city that is really kind of on the forefront uh, with regards to uh, innovation, um, you you've probably all read about the uh, the, the the new tunnel that's going to be built between uh, Brightline uh, and the beach with uh, you know with the boring company. Um, obviously, what 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 Bryce and and the Panthers have done in in Holiday Park is is kind of an innovative uh, project. Same thing with the you know with the Inter Miami. So people are attracted to markets that you know are on the forefront of both you know opportunity as well as inclusion as well as innovation um so the talent is certainly uh coming here in and in, in in wrapping up the next slide really just talks about kind of where we kind of see the cycle and again everything that i uh that i talked about tells you that we are firmly you know planted on the the left side of the the circle here um, I mean, certainly there's a, 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 a palatable amount of relief with regards to, you know, vaccinate vaccinations and embracing, uh, you know, the, the science and, and moving to a, a kind of a new uh, normal. We obviously still have some challenges with some of our uh, core industries, namely in the in the cruise, in, you know, industry. Um, but that is not slowing the confidence, the optimism, the excitement uh, that people see for our city. Um, South, Fort Lauderdale is really uh, positioned now as the center of a region. The South Florida region is an extremely dynamic region, and we are uh, the center of it. So, um, you know, again, still a little bit of 
uh, challenges that we're that we're working through. Again, like I said, namely somewhat related to uh, crews and tourism, but but for the most part. Uh, and I know we're not talking about, you know, hospitality or other markets here, but our retail markets, our hospitality markets have all rebounded to be post uh, post peak pricing. Um, so the traveler has returned. Um, we're just still waiting for a little bit of the of the of, of, of some of the industries uh, to fully, uh, fully rebound. But it's not stopping, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, a, a, a look towards. Uh, a look towards uh, full recovery, full expansion. Um, and so we're very excited with the dynamics of uh, both population and, and business growth uh, for Fort Lauderdale. And again, like I said, uh, the one other area that, um, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, what drives, you know, real growth into the city um, is also around, you know, culture, and parks and open space, people really, again, in a post COVID environment, um, you know, the city has committed a couple of hundred million dollars to expanding and improving the parks, similar to what uh, Bryce is doing in Holiday Park. Um, but you're gonna see, you know, tremendous uh, infrastructure, innovation, cultural activities, open space, all of which are, again, you know, fueling the, uh, the talent migration to our market. So. On the residential side, uh, we are we are extremely optimistic about where uh, Fort Lauderdale is positioned. And thank you, uh, Jenny. Happy to uh, we'll get into some questions later on, but um, really more interested in hearing from the panel. So thank you. Great, Ken. Thank you so much. And again, great reports. Uh, we have all of those accessible on our website, and we'll be sending a link to all of our attendees to download a copy of that. Um, thanks again for, you know, great data, great insight, and not only where we're at, but where we're going. Um, you mentioned something, Ken, I think it's a good, good segue into our panel discussion about a pioneering market. Um, we have over 80 folks listening in right now, and I I'd, I'd bet that several don't know that this is kind of second gen pioneering, because 20 plus years ago, kind of the OGs of development here in Fort Lauderdale, um, several of whom are my, our board members here at the DDA, they made their first kind of mark into downtown Fort Lauderdale for residential. There were maybe a handful of condo, um, maybe just a few condo developments on the river, high luxury product. And now we have over 10,000 rental apartment built, uh, projects, uh, units. So, you know, in just two decades, there's been tremendous growth and as you mentioned, there's about 2,000 units under construction, another 2,000 in the planning stages. Um, about 4,000 units have been delivered in just the past three years. And we have recently been told at one of our board meetings that the velocity of move-ins um, almost doubled in, during the COVID pandemic. And we were seeing upwards of 250 move-ins of units per month. So clearly this is a destination people want to live, they want to invest. And um, for you know, Michael, Bryce, and Alan, before we get into your project specifically, can you just kick off and tell us why is that? Why, from your point of view, do you think downtown Fort Lauderdale is the place for kind of second gen pioneering investment? And um, Alan, I'll start with you. We'll go not so much in alphabetical order, but your name's right there. So uh, if you could each just please introduce yourself and um, you know your company and your role, and then tell us a little bit about why Fort Lauderdale. Great, well, thanks, Jenny. I appreciate you, um, you having me on, on today. And uh, so I'm Alan Kennedy and I'm, I'm a managing director with Heinz and I'm responsible for our business, both acquisition and new development in the South Florida region. Um, so why do I think Fort Lauderdale has grown like it has over the past couple of decades? Um, I, I think, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot about, you know, in general, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a bunch, and Ken kind of alluded to several of these points, but I really think that South Florida is at a point of its kind of coming of age. It's a, um, you know, a lot of the trends that we're seeing today were kind of happening before COVID. And I think what happened is COVID just kind of brought a lot of this to the forefront and made everybody notice it. But when you look at Fort Lauderdale as a whole or as a piece of the region, um, you know, I find that, um, and I think a lot of people find that it, it happens to be not only central, um, but I think it also happens to be 
um, more similar to parts of the country where folks are coming from. Um, it may not, you know, Miami's not for everybody, West Palm is not for everybody, but Fort Lauderdale seems to, to fit a lot more of the, of the populations that are coming here from an affordability perspective, from a central perspective, from a um, availability of schools uh, and quality of schools perspective. And so when you look at what Fort Lauderdale offers from the quality of life, life to the access to amenities such as the beach, uh, to business, to the more corporate cultures that are, that are that tend to be in Broward versus some of the other markets that tend to be, you know, more finance or more private equity, but are smaller offices. Um, I just think Fort Lauderdale um, is just being it's being more recognized now um, for the positive things that it provides to the South Florida region. Michael, Kushner's making a big investment and uh, really envisioning, you know, great development along Broward Boulevard, close to the Bright Line. You know, why was Fort Lauderdale a strong choice in the South Florida market for your company? Well, when we looked at Fort Lauderdale, um, again, to piggyback on what Alan was talking about, we really like the centrality of Fort Lauderdale. It's, uh, and now with the Bright Line over there, you have a great connectivity to, uh, to Miami and great connectivity to Palm Beach County. You know, 10 years ago, there was no luxury product on the, on the rental space in Fort Lauderdale. And I think what's really happened there is that Fort Lauderdale is really a great case study of if you build it, they will come. Yeah. And what you've seen, at least with it started with Amore and then Icon, is that we started putting up luxury towers over there and then people started coming and the rent started increasing. So when we got into Fort Lauderdale, we, we sort of focused on an area that had been neglected um, for, for many, many years because it's immediately west of the tracks. But what we saw that the, uh, the Bright Line was, uh, was starting again and that the city center was moving over there, we viewed it as an opportunity to really uh, create a new center of the downtown area. Um, you know, as Alan said, again, Miami is not for everybody. I live in Miami, but I think if you're moving from uh, other areas of the country, Fort Lauderdale affords a familiarity that is uh, that makes it feel more like many areas of the Northeast. Miami is a great city, uh, but it's not for everybody. It's it's uh, good 10, 15 years ahead of where Fort Lauderdale is. It's it's uh, a very programmatic city in terms of what you can build. Uh, you know, you have Miami 21 over there, and you don't really have that in Fort Lauderdale. So I think that for the person who wants to be in Fort Lauderdale and wants some sort of more accessibility to all, to all the regions, to, to be able to live in Fort Lauderdale and go work in Miami and go work in Palm Beach. Um, Fort Lauderdale and our site specifically affords them that option that they had not previously been offered. Great, and we wanna definitely hear more about the two projects that um, Alan and Michael have on the table. You talked about familiarity and you know if, if anyone's not familiar with the Florida Panthers, um, they've been living under a rock. We've had uh, an amazing team since Wayne Heisinger and, and friends brought them to town in 93, I think it was. So, you know, Bryce, you joined the agency and you're leading the, the efforts to invest in Holiday Park, kind of our central park in Fort Lauderdale. You know, can you tell us why um, downtown Fort Lauderdale was an important location for the Panthers to really expand into the future? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, it's an exciting time for me as well. I'm I'm a newcomer to, to Fort Lauderdale. Moved we moved here about six months ago. So uh, exciting time to be a Fort Lauderdale resident and a, and a Florida Panther and part of the organization. So um, so as the executive vice president of the Florida Panthers, I I oversee anything that touches operations. So arena operations, food and beverage, technology, um, and then also the oversight of the construction of the uh, of the War Memorial Holiday Park initiative that you spoke about. Um, so I'm, I have the privilege of, of overseeing that, uh, that $65 million project that I know we'll get into later. Um, you know, so, you know, several reasons why, why the Viola family and, and the Florida Panthers uh, wanted to raise the flag there. I think there was you know, some history of Holiday Park and, and maybe some revitalization that, that, that needed to happen in the area. So the city had come to the Viola family and, and asked if you know, there was an interest in partnering um, uh, and re revitalizing the War Memorial Auditorium. You know, I think it started out with maybe just one, you know, ice rink and, um, and Vinny as he is, 
said, Hey, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And let's do it big. So it's now transformed into to two ice sheets. It'll be uh, the, the, um, the refurbishment of the war memorial. So 3,500, 4,000 cap concert venue that that'll transform into. There'll be a restaurant and, and really a, a cool space for the community. Um, you know, it's important for us that throughout Broward County that, that we have exposure um, in the community for the kids to grow, to grow the game of hockey. Um, and, and really what's important it, part of the Viola family's values and the Florida Panthers values of being a staple in the community. Um, and I think that, that over the years, you know, we've really shown that. Um, so really the footprint in the East gives us even more exposure um, to be able to grow the sport and do more in the community. Well, that's great. I know so many are looking forward to that and, and seeing it under construction today is really uh, exciting, so good. Um, you know, we'll jump in and I'll kind of facilitate some of the questions that come in as we go. But I noticed um, Ina Lee, I think, spoke about workforce housing. So, you know, we're talking about um, an affluent, you know, young professional population that's living here. We've also seen dozens of new restaurants open up, about 900 hotel rooms. So we have employees that service our hospitality sector. Um, Alan and Michael, can you talk a little bit about both how your projects and the market in general is responding to the need for workforce and how some of the complementary, um, um, I guess, supply and demand um, uh, equations work into providing both luxury workforce and housing for all? Sure, I can, um, I, I can start with that. You know, I think um, when it came to Fat Village, and we can talk about Fat Village um, a little bit more, but I can tell you when we were, when we were looking at the, the residential component to Fat Village, um, you know, the good news about our partnership um, with Urban Street Development um, here in, in Fort Lauderdale is that, you know, the restaurant people, Tim Petrillo is a part of our group, and he has 600 people that work for him that are chefs, servers, et cetera. And, you know, one of the tenants that we, that we had in the, the planning of the project was to provide a place where, where employees like that could, could come in and, and live and, and be a part of the Fat Village community. So what we tried to do was, was create a, vi a wide variety of living options within the project so that we could, you know, um, be able to address all price points. Um, we spend a lot of time at Heinz making sure that the rent that, that is underwritten or, or that would be demanded for a project fits within a certain uh, percentage of, of a user's income. So we, we spend a lot of time looking at the surrounding area, what the income is that they bring in, and then trying to have price points that are in the, the 25, 30, 35% of their income range. And so as long as we can do that, we, we, we usually feel that we've, we've been able to create a, a wide variety of, of, of of housing options for folks. But I think that, you know, you brought a great point is, is, you know, it doesn't do any good to build a project that's gonna become exclusive. You know, our idea is when we're build, building a project, we look at it as a village in which you have opportunities for, for all people uh, to come in and access the project. Okay, great. I think, um, you know, the, the point you make is actually, it's, it's not something that's unique to Fort Lauderdale. It's more of a nationwide problem. And as construction costs go up and as uh, land prices go up, it gets more and more challenging for developers to build uh, housing that is attainable for, for, for most workers. So one of the things we try to do, and we're doing it in Miami as well, is we try to build units that are, are affordable in the sense that, and they are attainable, so they might be a little smaller, but if you can get to a price point that, that's under $2,000 a month, that makes it much more, um, accessible to the to the workers over there um, versus because you're right it doesn't make any sense to have a building that's exclusive to only people who are making two hundred thousand dollars a year you want to make sure that you're building communities and you're not building um, you're not building uh, uh, exclusive neighborhoods so as developers you always try to accommodate all all um, all income classes so what you're trying to do is obviously will endeavor to create units that are, might be a little smaller, but obviously attainable for someone who wants to live in the area and work in the area without having to live 30 miles away and, and then have to travel two hours every morning to get to work. Well, I think that's a testament to both of your projects being just walking distance to the Brightline station 
um, you know, South Florida coming together to really explore implementing commuter service on the FEC tracks, you know, having the amenities of downtown living. So if you do have smaller units, you know, you have wonderful outdoor spaces to go to and a great urban environment. Um, so, you know, I think the, the kind of um, equation of transportation, housing costs, the amenities that urban living provides also starts to help with that. Um, well, good, good. So, you know, let's hear a little bit more about these two projects. Um, can, can you tell us, Michael, what really the vision for um, um, your investment here in Fort Lauderdale is and kind of the status and where you're going with that? Sure. Um, like I said earlier, when we, when we got into this site, our, we were focused on what was coming to Fort Lauderdale, focused on the Bright Line and focused on the, on the new government center, the joint government center. And at the time, we were content with the number of units we could build there. Um, however, um, and led by our land use attorney, Stephanie Toothaker, we endeavored and we succeeded in rezoning the entire area um, into the RAC CC or into the RAC for most of it. Because we felt that the limitations were not enough. There was more demand than what we were able to supply under the old zoning. So what we're going to be doing here is creating a very unique pedestrian experience uh, for those who are getting off the right line. We're going, again, we're, we're relatively early in the pre-development stage, but I assure you that when this actually is complete, it is going to redefine the Fort Lauderdale skyline. You will see something so iconic when you come off the highway that it'll be unlike anything that is, that is in the area. And it is really going to create a new center of downtown. And as that area continues to evolve, and as the Bright Line um, gets back on and everybody, and everybody gets back to their offices, and him or she starts to evolve. And obviously PMG's deal created tremendous connectivity over there as well. Um, you're going to, and we think that this is going to be a, a really a new downtown area uh, where people are going to want to live. You know, people in Miami and South Florida in general, we don't like to walk that much, it's very hot. So what we, the fact that um, it's, you know, that it's a TOD development, that is so accessible and that you can get to the train and there, there will be restaurants and hopefully um, some sort of you know, grocer downstairs. That'll make it so unique that we're just so excited about what's coming. And, um, and again, we're, we think that um, especially pre-COVID and now during COVID and post-COVID, the, uh, the demand for that product is going to exceed the supply that we can deliver. That's great. And you know, really when, New investments and new projects can complement and leverage investments that have already been made in the community. You know, that district, the arts and entertainment district, really at the Western Gateway of downtown with the Broward Center, Museum of Discovery and Science, um, the beautiful connection to the Riverwalk. I mean, it starts to really knit together the fabric of our urban setting um, and create these new districts, which, you know, that's the beauty and evolution of a city is, you know, Flagler Village, Fat Village, it's really come into its own. Um, there was a lot of deliberate planning that went into that, but this, this vision for your Fat Village project, Alan, um, tell us how that evolved over the years, how your partners, you know, set the stage for that, but also, you know, what the project is. So I'm um, happy to. So Fat Village, um, you know, I think the, the most interesting part about Fat Village is it, it is a creative neighborhood that exists today. It's not a contrived area that we're trying to dream up and then try to, you know, um, try to, you know, create within the, the, the Flagler Village neighborhood. But it's something that started well over 20 years ago. Um, the, the development of that part of, of Flagler Village that is now the finest fat village, you know, our partners have been in since the beginning, uh, be it um, Doug McCraw, um, who, who bought the warehouse buildings, you know, 20 some odd years ago, or Alan Hooper, who came in and started building loft apartments and, and condominiums in that particular area. Um, so the real tenet for Fat Village was how can you create something that provides mass density and amenity base in that part of the city or that part of Flagler Village, but yet um, still preserves and promotes the, uh, the creative neighborhood in which it sits. And so that's kind of what started the whole, um, the whole planning process of, it, process of, the, of the project. You know, it, it's an old warehouse district, and so um, a lot of uh, a lot of attention has been kept on preserving 
or celebrating the warehouse nature and aesthetic of, of some of the buildings. And you, you know, I think a lot of people have probably been to art walks over there and have peered inside some of the old buildings and have seen the the, the structure, the bow truss structures that are, that are there. You know, we think those are pretty special and, and we're gonna find ways to preserve those and introduce those type of elements throughout the project, along with the community art uh, that's there and the celebration of the local artists that, that, have, that have called Flat Village home for the past you know, 20 years. Um, when it came time for planning the project, and the plant, the project right now is planned for about 835,000 square feet of uses. There's about 500,000, about 500 uh, multifamily units, about 350,000 square feet of office, and then about 70,000 square feet, 70, 80,000 square feet of retail. Um, but as we looked at each of those components, uh, you know, Flagler Village itself had, has done pretty well from a um, from a residential perspective, as, we, as we've talked about. Um, and then you've certainly seen the amenity base uh, in the area creep up around um, around Federal Highway. Um, but the the western side of of Flagler Village, um, you know, did not have a ton of amenities or a ton of 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 areas where folks could go and eat, et cetera. But the draw of the Bright Line was really, in our opinion, pulling a center of gravity from just being on Federal Highway toward the west, toward the Bright Line Station. And so we felt that there was a great opportunity to introduce uh, the retail um, component of the project that could address folks that live on that half of the project, or also that could be a draw to folks that live in the, in the overall Fort Lauderdale area. Um, when it came to office, you know, if you look at the office demand that is in downtown Fort Lauderdale today, um, there were large blocks of space that are that are that are missing or efficient floor places or modern spaces. And so we figured that if we could take um, and create modern office space in an aesthetic that nods toward the warehouse district that, that was there, combine that with um, with retail amenity base. Um, we could really um, we and the residential for the area we could create a, a project that that had enough density and mass and it also could be a village in and of itself so that folks could live there work there shop there and it would not um, and it would also be a draw to the overall um, region. Well, that's great. Um, we look forward to learning more about the office product too because you know as we say retail follows rooftops and we've seen such a tremendous growth in the number of restaurants and kind of service offerings to, to feed our hungry, growing downtown population. But we also need office space so that as this young professional population lives in downtown, more companies locate here. And, and Ken, you know, your, your team has been working with the city of Fort Lauderdale for years to really move forward some of these important civic investments. And, and Michael talked about the joint government campus Ken, can you just tell us in, in the audience a little bit about what some of those major civic projects um, are and, and why they're so important? And I think that'll be a good segue back to Bryce to, to really help us understand how you know, investing in, in sports and the Panthers um, community helps drive continued growth in downtown. Ken? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, Michael touched on it a little bit, you know, the, the joint government campus uh, which in and of itself is really kind of, you know, innovative and uh, very unique. I mean, you know, Alan does, I'm sure you do business all over the country. It's very unique where you get, you know, cities and counties that, you know, kind of come together and, and, and look to the future in terms of uh, efficiency and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so that project in and of itself is transformative, but when you really sort of pull back and look at the landscape, you realize that between the city and the county um, and the federal courthouse, the, the, the government entities control so much real estate in the downtown core, which is, again, a very uh, unique opportunity to really effectuate you know, change. A lot of times it's done and very effectively through areas like zoning or density bonuses or so on and so forth. But when they actually control the real estate, it is a it is an opportunity to be you know even more uh, transformative. So, what the city, uh, what the joint government campus does is really is the first of many many dominoes to kind of fall. Once those sites 
uh, start to become uh, freed up, you start doing the math in and around Broward where, you know, where, where Kushner and Michael are, you know, all the way up, you know, to where City Hall is, where, you know, where Allen is. You look at the federal courthouse that's going to transform parts of the, you know, the south part of the river. And you really see that uh, the city has got and the county um, have really got an unbelievable opportunity to accelerate uh, the, the the transformation of of downtown um, and their their commitment to to being to being innovative. Again, Bryce can talk about that, but you know the the, the structure that they did with the Panthers. Um, I think you'll see that same kind of innovation progressiveness, uh, creativity when it comes to developing on their own real estate. Um, so it, it, I think both the city and the county have proven uh, that they have a, a, a mindset to be you know, very forward thinking, uh, very progressive, very uh, transformational. Um, and the fact that they control the actual real estate themselves, again, I think really bodes well for what the uh, what the future is going to hold. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but as we look at where the city has come over the last, you know, five or 10 years, the next five or 10 look to be even more uh, exciting and transformative. Great, great. And Bryce, maybe you can tell us a little bit more detail on the status of the project and when we'll all be able to skate. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we did a groundbreaking ceremony. It was at the end of May. Um, and, and so far, you know, I had a look at the building today from the, the beautiful courtyard Marriott rooftop. And, um, I was there this morning you can see the steel's already being, um, erected and, and, and they're well underway. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, 144,000 square foot project, as I said before, comprised of, of two ice rinks. Uh, the Panthers will train there. We'll, we'll still uh, have a footprint in Coral Springs at the ice den. Uh, but the Panthers will move the training facility and all that in the head office to um, to the War Memorial. Um, uh, the, we're working with Live Nation on the concert piece, which is, again, a, another piece that brings uh, to, the, to the city and community a really the hub of recreation and entertainment that we're that we're proud to be part of. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any more questions that that may be involved with that, uh, the project in general. But, uh, you know, we're certainly excited for it. Well, great. Yeah, Bryce also mentioned, I'm sorry, Jenny, but Bryce oh. mentioned, you know, Live Nation and the concert, and I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about also uh, the one-stop uh, proposal, which again, I think is really going to have a, a uh, tremendous effect on the, the culture and the entertainment and the, the, the activation and giving uh, a lot of our residents, you know, a lot more uh, cultural and, uh, and amenities in, in, in the downtown core. So, um, that project with entertainment, cultural, art exhibits, uh, public spaces um, is really also part of the, you know, the city's uh, forward thinking in terms of transforming the experience in downtown. And, you know, that's really been our role here at the DDA is to try to, you know, convene partners to, to advance important initiatives and focusing on our downtown parks and open spaces um, it's kind of been in our DNA, you know, from, from the 70s and 80s and, and much of the Riverwalk and, and several of our crown jewels in downtown were results of hard work from, from previous DDA leadership. And, and like the uh, public-private partnerships like you just discussed, we're also working on advancing a reimagining of housing a park to really create, you know, an, a first-class urban park destination on the river. Um, I'm going to put something up and, and I kind of want to hear everyone's um, thoughts on this. And, you know, recently the DDA, uh, we kicked off our, um, can everyone see this rendering? So this is um, something that we put out uh, in our residential report this, this summer. And, you know, it's looking, looking down the road to the future. So, you know, we have Fat Village in there. We have um, Kushner's proposal as we've seen it today. We have about 20 different projects that could really pepper our skyline in the next decade or so. And, and one that we probably get asked the most questions about, Bryce, and I'll put you a bit on the spot is, you know, the Panthers are making a major investment in Holiday Park. Um, when and if 
would we ever see the Panthers play in downtown? And how does that really complement what Ken was saying with having you know, uh, availability of, of city and, and county owned land to advance big ideas and big initiatives? No, it's a great question. And we get it all the time. And, you know, the answer depends on the day, the time of day, the who's asking and who's answering it. Um, you know, in, in the in the immediate term here, you know, we're committed, you know, to the county, you know, in general. Um, you know, we still have six or seven years on the, on the lease at the, at, the, at the FLA Live Arena in Sunrise. So uh, with that said, we know that a decision has to be made that arenas are not built overnight and negotiations and contracts take a while. Um, so I think within the next, you know, you know, year or two, we'll have some direction on on which way we're going to move. Um, you look at what arenas and stadiums are doing these days in sports entertainment and, and, and they're moving towards, you know, the entertainment districts. It's no longer just an arena, you know, by itself. They're attached to retail restaurants and other revenue drivers um, that bring value and benefit to the community. Um, so, again, uh, there's been no decision made. Um, we know a lot of people want us to move down there. Um, it's a significant investment that I think that, you know, would fall on the shoulders of the Viola family and, and the um, and the government as well. Uh, we talked about public and private partnerships. You know, these are, you look at these arenas, they're $5 billion these days, not saying that a hockey arena would cost that much, uh, you know, but it would, it would be somewhere um, in that lower range. Um, you know, great question. It would be fabulous. I love that that rendering you put up because it just gives me so much excitement on, on what's to come here. Well, that's great. You know, we, we truly believe Fort Lauderdale is the center of it all. And, you know, the type of investments that you all are making, um, the vision for an inclusive, you know, dynamic downtown um, for, for our generation, for the next generation, all the infrastructure investments our public sector partners are making, um, you know, all of this goes into really the recipe for a sophisticated, innovative, and um, you know, vibrant downtown. So, um, any last comments? Any kind of you know, if if we do this, we have this conversation in another five years. You know, what what would you say would be success at that point, Michael? Maybe I'll kick it off with you. Well, I just wanted to touch on a point that Ken mentioned, um, and that's the city's involvement. One of the things we like about Fort Lauderdale is that it's a big city, but in many ways, it's also a small town. In Miami, again, you go out and you comply with Miami 21 and you go through the process and you get your building built. In the city um, of Fort Lauderdale, you're, there's a constant interaction uh, with the mayor and the commission, and they've been incredibly supportive of our project. And they are, they, they are the ones that are looking out to Fort Lauderdale, uh, what it's going to look like in the next 10 years. And I think that's why they are so involved. So. As we continue to work with them, and we really have a great relationship with Mayor Trumpelis and Commissioner Glassman and the rest of the commission, I think that as you look in 10 years from now, you're going to see a skyline that is probably unique, uh, with, certainly within the state of Florida, and um, because they're really focusing on curating an environment that's focused on design that's not overly dense and creates an amazing um, resident experience. So the desirability of people to move to Fort Lauderdale is only going to be enhanced. And like I said, there's a lot of has been a lot of supply has been delivered into Fort Lauderdale in the last few years, and there's a lot in the pipeline. But, but when comparing it to Miami, and especially considering how many condos go up in Miami versus how many go up in Fort Lauderdale you're going to see, it's going to be a really, really nice neighborhood to live in. And again, Fort Lauderdale is, again, it's a city, but it's really a neighborhood. And it just affords people a lifestyle that is really unique in South Florida and even unique where there's a downtown that's so close by. Wonderful. Any other um, comments? I, I, you know, in fairness, I've always offered to address questions from our uh, attendees. So there, there have been, there's one, how, how is new growth and investment addressing, you know, resiliency, um, sea level rise, you know, right now we're in the midst of king tides, even having a beautiful river that cuts through downtown, you know, we're, we're aware of the issues of resiliency, you know, maybe Alan, Mike, if, Michael, if you could just 
briefly hit on how your projects are helping to advance you know, stronger infrastructure and make Fort Lauderdale more resilient through your type of investment? Yeah, I, I can just state from a, from a resiliency perspective, that is one of our, um, our major tenets of design. Um, it comes into everything from looking at the glass to the placement of generators to, to whatever. But you know, even at Fat Village, um, you know, we'll be raising that whole elevation of that block you know, about an average of 12 inches. I think it's two feet on one end and about seven inches on the other end. Uh, but that is all done you know, in, in, in response to resiliency. We're also um, we've got um, an investment that we'll be making in the in the stormwater and the sewer um, sewer infrastructure that that serves that particular area. And, and I do have to say that that when when you compare Fort Lauderdale to other communities in South Florida, I think one thing that um, that is that is on the forefront, and I, I'm not sure if, if if many people will know it as much, but Fort Lauderdale is spending probably more money on their infrastructure and pre-planning for their growth than what we've seen in some of the, uh, in some of the other cities that, that are in the region. And I think that's gonna be very beneficial. I think it's, it speaks a lot to the leadership and I think it speaks a lot to, um, to you know, what the, um, what the long-term growth plans are for the city. Um, again, I, I think the accessibility to, to amenities in the area, be it the beach, be it central location, be it, um, the interstates, Brightline, et cetera. It, I think it's, it is, it is fantastic in Fort Lauderdale. And I think it is premier. And I think that's one of the things that will continue to, to have people consider Fort Lauderdale for, um, for their home or their business uses. And, you know, as, as Ken mentioned, and as, as Michael mentioned, and, and even Bryce to that, so you've got a leadership here that's thinking about that and, and planning for it. And so, um, you know, I think, I think the city's doing the right thing. That's great. Definitely, you know, leadership at all levels in the public sector, the private sector, and then community engagement and support. And we have such a growing population. You know, it's, it's our role here at the DDA to help connect, help be conveners. And um, I think with that, we're, we're hitting close to 11. So I'm going to wrap it up. And, um, you know, if, if there's uh, no other comments from our panelists. I really want to thank you, Michael, Bryce, and Alan, for joining us today on this great conversation, um, the pulse of downtown Fort Lauderdale. We will circle back around after the new year, Ken, with our um, installment of our office uh, retail and um, hospitality commercial real estate report in, the, um, in, in January. So please, for all of our attendees, um, stay in touch with us, DDA, FTL, uh, through social media, through our website, and um, continue to learn about all the wonderful things that are happening here in downtown Fort Lauderdale. I thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Have a great day. Good weekend.